That's why we're here. To talk about, to declare the good news that has come to mankind, the good news that has come to you and I. And over the course of this Christmas season, we've been talking about the power of the words. The good news of these words, love, joy, forgiveness, salvation, freedom, and today, peace. Say that with me, peace. It's hard to find in the news. In light of the events of the last, just even this year, the last number of months, one could say, how can peace be seen as little more than a Hallmark card or a well wish extended at the grocery store? Continuing on from August the 9th uh, in 2014, along there continues to be both peaceful protests and looting and violent unrest in the Ferguson area continues now into November the 24th after a grand jury decides not to indict the police officer who shoots Michael Brown. October the 22nd, Ottawa at the National, Canadian National War Memorial, Michael Zahaf Bebu fatally shoots Corporal Nathan Cirillo, a Canadian soldier on ceremonial sentry duty. He enters the nearby center block parliament building at Parliament Hill where our leaders are attending caucuses and after wrestling with a security guard at the entrance, Bibbo ran inside, is cornered and killed by the common sergeant at arms, Kevin Vickers, after a shootout. Following those shootings, the downtown core of Ottawa is placed on lockdown while police continually searched. And on Tuesday, December the 16th, Australian authorities storm a cafe where a self-styled Muslim cleric has been holding hostages since Tuesday. They kill the gunmen some 16 hours after the siege begins. Hearing gunfire inside the Lint Chocolate Cafe, New South Wales police officer Scipione reports, two of the hostages of the 17 hostages initially held by the gunmen die. Others are injured, including a police officer who suffers from a face shot. Wednesday the 17th, at least 141 children, most of them children, die when Taliban gunmen attack a school in the morning. 187 are wounded. The overwhelming majority of the victims are children between the ages of 1 and 10 years of age. Condemnations pour outside across the globe, including all major political leaders and notables in the country. Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif and Army Chief General Rahil Sharif also condemn the assault. They rush to Peshawar to show their support of the victims. Three days of mourning is announced by the federal government as darkness falls on the area as they clear the area of militants. And then last night, an armed man walks up to two New York City Police Department officers sitting in their patrol room car. He opened fire, shooting them both in the head before running into a nearby subway station committing suicide himself. The New York City's police commissioner says the two officers are ambushed, killed in the cruiser, are quite literally, simply assassinated. Peace. The definition of peace is defined as the occurrence of harmony characterized by the lack of violence, conflict behaviors, and the freedom from fear of violence. It is commonly understood as the absence of hostility and retribution. Peace also suggests some sincere attempts at reconciliation, the existence of uh, healthy or newly healed interpersonal or international relationships, the prosperity in matters of social and economic welfare for all, the establishment of equality, and a working political order that serves the true interests of all. The Christmas message, the good news the gospel is as much about peace as it is about love and joy and forgiveness and all those other words. And universally, it is probably one of the most important words, if not the most important word of the gospel message, peace to mankind. In the New Testament, Jesus, the Messiah, is called the Prince of Peace. He says that I have come to bring peace, John says. He came to, to lead our feet into paths of peace, the Luke's gospel records. The good news of Jesus is the gospel of peace, according to Paul in Ephesians 6. Refusing peace, the peace that Jesus declares, has some 
has great real world consequences. He says in Luke 19, if you had ever known, had only known this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they are the children of God. Paul continually in all of his epistles declares that we as his people are to walk in both grace and peace. Peace is such a broad term, isn't it? We have all kinds of our own ideas. We could go around the room and talk about what do you see as peace? What brings peace to your heart, to your life? The biblical usage goes far beyond our common conception of the absence of violence, peace being the absence of violence. It's more than just that. For any injustice breaks peace as much as outright war. This week I read that in the 3,350 years between 1500 BC and 1850 AD. There were only 286 years on our planet spent without war taking place on this globe somewhere. That's 13 years of war for every one year of peace. During that same period of time, there were 8,000 peace treaties that were established all of which were broken and most of which were broken in less than two years years. It's ironic, isn't it? Both Canada and the United States have so large assortment of peace monuments. There's almost no town, no city, no place that you cannot go that you will not find peace monuments. And yet we build another one after every war. Charles Swindle wrote, It seems to us that world peace is a distant, unattainable dream, a political football to be kicked back and forth by eloquent ambassadors, a philosophical fantasy, that, that glorious moment in history where everybody stands around and reloads for the next war. Not only is there no lasting peace among the nations, but it's hard to find here. It's hard to find peace in our own lives. It's absent in many of our homes and our, our neighborhoods and in our communities. Every day, local newspapers and nightly television newscasts are filled with stories of assaults and shootings and robberies. Statistics indicate that domestic violence is not diminishing. It is ever actually increasing year after year after year, showing that we have more homes that are having the lack of peace than experiencing peace. In North America alone, two million couples have used a lethal weapon on their spouses at least once in their lifetime. Three to four million women are beaten by their husbands every single year in North America. 2.7 million children are beaten, maimed, murdered, or neglected every year in North America by their families. Peace. We only have to look within our own heart to find the absence of peace in our own lives. Many of you here today are missing peace in your life. We're constantly fighting our own inner battles to free ourselves from anxiety, hostility, and fear. We worry about our jobs, about our health, about our money, about our, about our children. There has never been a more stress-ridden society than ours. Panic anxiety is the number one mental health issue for women, and it is number two, second only to substance abuse for men. Stress has become a way of life, and with it, peace. Peace is something that we all desperately need and want, which is why we spend untold millions of dollars every year in the search of peace. We spend thousands on professional counselors and therapists. Diplomats fly all over the world pursuing peace between nations. Our court systems are jammed with cases that arise from the breakdown of peace between both individuals and corporations. And with all this spending on the various pursuits for peace, peace has not worked. Because hear me now, the truth is this. Peace is not something that you purchase. Peace is something you receive. The kind of peace that we need and yearn for is a gift. You do not purchase peace. You receive peace. A peace that God lovingly gave us when he sent his son, the Prince of Peace, into our world. 2,000 years ago, the night those angels sang that wonderful song of peace, the peace that Jesus truly is, gives is the most wonderful expression of peace. 
as his word says, it is not the kind of peace that the world gives. It is a peace that passes human understanding. The gift of peace that Jesus gives is a kind of peace that enables us to experience an inner calm in spite of all the circumstances that would normally cause us stress and doubt. It is like the calm, in the, like the eye in the center of a hurricane. Perfect stillness and peace while the storm may rage all around. I be, Isaiah's writings of the Christ child may be the most familiar of the Old Testament. He says in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Eternal Father, and say it with me, Prince of Peace. Handel included those words in the great chorus of the Messiah, his orchestral work. And chances are you either heard it sung already this year or you will before the end of this Christmas season. However, we pull this passage out of the box only during holidays. I, I wonder sometimes why do we only read Isaiah 9, 6 but once a year? It's like one of those ornaments that we use to decorate our houses or, or, a, or a red ball that we place upon a Christmas tree. Though, though while we still wait for the full realization of his kingdom come, the promised Messiah is still the greatest political ruler ever. Messiah wrote this pro or Isaiah wrote this prophecy about Messiah at least 100 years before Israel was taken into Babylonian captivity, nearly 600 years before the birth of the Savior. And while looking at all of the failed monarchs and, and sitting in the rubble of Israel's weak and impotent to, uh, situation, Isaiah looks across the centuries of time to when God would rule on earth through his son Jesus. He says, a child will be born to us. He comes as a human being in the form of a child so that he can endure the temptations that men face and yet be without sin. Isaiah declares that a son will be given to us, that he existed before his birth as the second person of the Trinity. Paul says in Philippians that although he existed in human form, God did not, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant and be made in the likeness of men, God in human flesh, to conquer both sin and death forevermore. Isaiah says that the government shall rest upon his shoulders, and thereby he affirms his lordship. Isaiah looks to a time in the future when Christ will reign over all the earth in a very literal way. Though the world reels and wonders if there will ever be peace, I can tell you today, the Bible is clear that one day Jesus Christ is going to come back and he will establish his kingdom rule and all of heaven and earth will bow before his lordship and authority here on this planet. But until that time, his kingdom has come, but it is hidden in the hearts of men and women who by faith declare that kingdom come in our lives. The Messiah's rule is over those of us who trust and obey him as Lord. And so when we talk about peace today, what does this mean? What does all of the discussion of Isaiah's uh, uh, prophecies so many th hundreds of years earlier, what does it mean for us today? Well, Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, to let the peace of Christ Rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message, let the good news of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with wisdom and hymns and songs and songs of the Spirit. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, for peace is the marker the marker that Christ is truly the supreme over your heart, over your life today. Not just the absence of conflict, but true shalom, as the Hebrews would call it. Shalom for a Jew was much more than just being peaceful. It was the presence of wholeness. It was the presence of completeness, meaning to act as an agent of healing. When they would, they would greet one another and they would say, shalom, my friend. They would say, shalom back, it would be returned. You weren't just saying, I'm at peace with you or you're at peace with me. It was not just, I'm not fighting at you, I'm not mad at you. It was an expression of a desire that there be a wholeness between us, that there be a wholeness in the other person's life. We see so many marriages that are broken, so many individuals where you're broken up and, 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 and the conflict between a husband and wife and children and, and conflict at work and you're fighting with your workmate or there's conflict uh, 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 with various people in your lives. There was a shalom, was, a, was to, be, to bring a wholeness and a completeness where there is dysfunction. 
To have shalom in a marriage was not the absence of fighting. It was a marriage that had everything that God intended it to be. Unity and love and romance and harmony and belonging together. To have shalom in your family was to have a harmony that believed in each other's and valued one another and their role and the importance that one another played within that family. It was an environment that cultivated the possibility in each other's lives. To have shalom in your life was to have a life that was put together, that was full and rich and abundant as God intended it to be. To have shalom in the workplace mean, meant to bring an honesty and an integrity and a wholeness to your lives whom you were called to serve and to those whom you were called to lead. It was, it was to create an, an environment where excellence in all manner of endeavors was experienced. Let's be honest. There's a lot that eats away at the shalom in our lives, isn't there? It's important that we be honest about this today and admit where there is peace and where there is not. <clears throat> because when peace is stolen, when peace is not there, when peace is absent from our lives, the problem is, is that we get desperate. We get desperate and we act out. And what happens is, is we lose control. And when we lose control, we get wise in our own eyes. And when that happens, everything we do makes for anything but peace. And so the very thing that we're desiring after, the very thing that is slipping through our fingertips, we will do everything we can to control and to create an environment that will bring back the peace that cannot be brought back because in the absence of peace, there is only control. Self-preservation kicks in and we'll do anything we can to get the control back into our lives. And so as a result of this, while we're not having peace, we will fight, we will argue, we will cheat, we will do anything in order to keep a handle on whatever seems to be falling through our fingers. We do it at home, we do it at church, and we do it at work. Why? Because control gives us a shadow image of peace. Control gives us a facsimile, if you would, of the shalom that Jesus promises. And I am contending today that much of our lives, our families, our marriages, our children, our work is shadowed in control. It's a facsimile of peace, a peace of our own manufacturing, but it is not the shalom of Jesus Christ. It is not the good news that has come but through the kingdom of God to our hearts and our lives. It's our attempt to create it in and of ourselves. Because if we can't find it, we can make it happen. How do we lose our peace? We lose our peace when our whole life gets out of control. We lose our peace when, when life's problems can't be explained and, and, and there's no answer and we thought we knew what we were doing. We thought we had direction. We, we thought we were moving forward and it just seems to be falling all apart around us. When the people that are in our lives and they're, they're unwilling to change and we think that they should be doing this, we think they should be acting this way and we think this is the right way for them and that this is how they're supposed to behave and, and we're coming into a season where, where we have all kinds of people that are going to be coming into our lives in the next five or six days and while we have great relationship, we have no fellowship. You know who they are. They're Aunt Nellie and Uncle Tom and, and Sister Susie and, 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 and Uncle Kate and, and all those other ones. And you don't see them but once or twice a year. Oh, they're a relation to you. But there's no fellowship because the last time you got together, there was nothing but tension and fighting. And so all you have is the anxiety. Oh, boy, how are we going to get past this one again? That's why everybody drinks so much at Christmas time. It's so we can have peace. We lose our peace when, when our problems have no explanation and no answer and, and I don't know what to do and I don't know how I'm going to figure this out and, 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 but I've got to figure it out because if I don't have it figured out then people will know that I, that I don't know what I'm doing and so you create some measure of, of, of answer or control or solution even though you know it's not going to work. When the pain is so unbearable and unrelenting and, and you don't think that you can take it any longer, you don't know how you're going to keep going, your past is, is haunting you and you can't seem to move on you know you need to move on. You want to move on, but you can't. And so that past turmoil creates nothing that is peaceful in your heart and your life today. Peace does not rule in your heart because control rules in your heart. And be assured today that whether we are looking to national and civil unrest or, or terrorism or the unceasing tensions and fightings in our living rooms and our kitchens, there is no peace without a full surrender to the Prince of Peace. In John chapter 16, Jesus told his disciples about the terrible events that would occur in the future. It was just a few days before. And as he told them the story, it included them abandoning him, his brutal death, about them being persecuted and killed for believing in him. 
And then in verse 33, Jesus says these words, I have told you all of this so that you might have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Peace in me. Did you hear the paradox? You will all abandon me. I will suffer. I will die a horrible death. You will then be persecuted and you will be killed. And I've told you all of this so that you might have peace. So this peace here refers to something other than what's happening on the outside, doesn't it? I would suggest to you today that it has everything to do with what's happening on the inside. You see, peace does not refer to the environment around us, nor is it conditional upon the circumstances we find ourselves in. We can have true peace in the midst of situations that are not peaceful. True peace is realized in our minds and our hearts, not in our physical surroundings or life's events. If we don't have peace in here, we will never have peace out there. And the problem therein lies for all of us is we're trying to create peace out there. But there's no peace in here. This Christmas season when you're getting together with people and there'll be tensions with your family and relationships and, and maybe there's some other things that will spill off on into the January and February March and you're trying to create peaceful situations. You're, can, can we all just make nice? Can we all just be good? You're trying to make this all right. This all can't be right because this isn't right. You gotta start with peace in here before you'll ever get peace out there. This is a facsimile. This, this is an image. This is a mirage of peace. The peace, the shalom that Christ is calling us to, it's not making nice. It's something that's true and real, and it's a gift that you receive, not an item that you purchase. (coughs) There is a secular thought driving the world's version of, of the Christmas message today that we are constantly bettering ourselves. We hear it all the time. We'll hear it more after Christmas as we move into the new year, and they'll reflect. They've already started doing a bit of that, but they'll reflect more and more on the year past. And, and these good wishes for a new year. We, we are that, that, that this idea that we're becoming more intelligent, we're becoming more civilized, we're becoming more advanced. Every year, the, the Christmas posture is that as we extend a facsimile of goodwill, of love and joy and peace to one another, that we're becoming nicer and more loving and more caring and more peaceful. And hopefully that we're doing going to do better in the year to come. But that's not true because if you look at this year, we're worse than we were in 2013. And if you look at 2013, we were worse than we were in 2012. We have no reason to believe that we're going to be any better in 2015. In fact, the statistics would tell us that we're going to be worse. That it couldn't be further from the truth that we're just as depraved, just as evil, just as selfish, and just as bent on our own destruction as we have ever been. Because in our world, we have never seen as much crime and sin and civil unrest and violence and murder and war and expressions of evil in all of history than there is in ours today. There is more slavery, there is more injustice, and there is more exploitation in this world than there has ever, ever been before. And it's not getting any better. Remember, folks, Coca-Cola may make nice commercials, but it's really only selling pop and nice thoughts. We need to remember that peace begins in the heart before it can ever happen in our world. There is this false sense of peace that can be given by the world through its own attempts at discussions and negotiations and treaties that, that most often end up being empty and useless. That's why the United Nations is a nice idea that doesn't work. Paul said in Ephesians 2, for Christ himself has made peace between us Jews and you Gentiles by making us all one people, that he has broken down the wall of hostility that used to separate us. So how do we realize that? This kingdom come that is in the hearts of men and women like you and I who believe by faith that the Prince of Peace has actually come this Christmas holiday season to the hearts and the lives, to those who will receive by faith that same message. How do we walk this path of peace? How do you find it? I would suggest to you today that the path of peace becomes, comes when we enter into a relationship with God. People have tried millions of different ways to find true peace on the inside, but the Bible is clear that it is only by being brought into a relationship with the true and the living God that we can find true peace. Romans 5 says, Therefore, since we've been made right with God by faith, we have peace with God. 
in order to see the peace with God that Jesus has secured potentially in the reality of our lives, we must be made right in his eyes. That means justified by faith. So the question that you and I must ask today is, am I right with God? Because you can, do, you can have all kinds of things that will create an image of, of peace in your life, but if you're not right with God, there is no peace. God desperately wants to make that bridge of peace between you and Him, and He wants it so much that He gave His Son to die on the cross. He gave His Son as a little baby who would eventually die a cruel and miserable death so that you could be made right, so that you could have peace. For those of us who received that, the path to peace begins when we allow the Holy Spirit to control our minds and our hearts. Romans 8 says that if your sinful nature controls your mind, there is death. But if the Holy Spirit controls your mind, there is life and peace. The sinful nature is directly opposed to the Spirit. We've been talking about that all fall. The issue is what is controlling our mind, which is the playing field and often the battleground, the place where there is the greatest wars that determines our words and our attitudes and our outlook and our actions and our habits and our behaviors. See, one will always be in control of us. One will always have the upper hand. One will always be the influencer in your life. Isaiah said, you will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. The way of peace starts with the rule of our hearts, and it is both the journey and the destination for the believer. For if the sinful nature controls our minds, then the destination is death. But if the Holy Spirit controls our minds, then the destination is life and peace. Past to peace begins when we surrender our, our worry to His will. Philippians 4 says, Be anxious about nothing but in everything, with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all human understanding, will keep your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. See, we want peace, don't we? We want God's peace, but we don't want to stop worrying. That's when we get the, what I call the yabbats. Well, God, yeah, I, I, God, I'm trusting you, but, yeah, but, God, I'm trusting you, but, yeah, but you don't understand. When you're praying to God, when you're talking to God about your circumstances, you just need to listen for that in your ear. If you start getting the yeah, buts, you're not trusting God. If you're praying to God with yeah, buts, you will never experience the peace of God. Because you're trying to worry and have God take care of it. And God says, I'm not going to move until you stop worrying. You tie my hands. God goes, I want to intervene. I want to step into this. But the, as long as you're worrying, you're controlling. As long as you're worrying, you're going to do something. As long as you're worrying, you're trying to figure out what you're going to do. The path to peace begins when we live in God's peace. Colossians 3 says, let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. There's that heart rule issue again. If Christ's peace rules in our hearts, then we will realize that we are members of one body. And so if I can let the peace of Christ rule in my heart, and Cheryl, my wife, can let the peace of Christ rule in her heart, then the peace of Christ can rule our marriage. And if I can get the peace of Christ, if the peace of Christ can rule in my daughter's, then the peace of Christ can rule in my family. And if it can rule in my family, then it can rule in your family, and your family, and your family, and your family. And if it can rule in my marriage, it'll rule in your marriage, and your marriage, and your marriage. And if it can rule with my kids, it'll rule with your kids, and your kids, and your kids. And if we can let the peace of Christ rule and reign over our hearts and lives, this world changes. And the Prince of Peace that has come, declared in the good news of the gospel, is made manifest in us. That's good news. That's what this is all about. That's how his kingdom come, as Handel sang so beautifully, shall reign forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Would you stand with me today? Would you let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts? 
I want you to know today that you can have you can have peace from God today that comes from acceptance it comes by admitting that you can that you can't create peace on your own that comes by just saying God I, I can't do this I am not creating peace I'm creating control and it's a mirrored image of peace but it doesn't last it's not true it's not shalom and it's not real Father, ask, I just ask that you come into my heart and my life, that I give my life, I surrender my life to you. Lord, I accept what your son has done by faith. I cannot do this on my own. If you can pray that prayer today, you can have peace with God. You and God can be made right. You don't have to wonder. I don't know if I'm right with God. You never have to wonder that. You can be assured of that today. Some of you need the peace not from God, but you need the peace of God. The peace of God only comes with trust. When you're not trying to get the yeah buts with, you're trying to figure it all out and yet you're still trying to pray and give it to God. No, you know what, God? I'm just going to trust you completely. I don't know how this is going to work out. I don't know about my marriage. I don't know about my kids. I don't know about my job. I don't know how we're going to make ends meet. You know I'm yours, oh Lord. And I know that some of the circumstances are because I've just been an idiot and I've made a mess of my life and I'm supposed to be a Christian. I'm supposed to know better, but I still have made a mess of my life. But I just got to trust you today to take what I have already messed up and would you help me to make it right? I trust you by faith. It's not peace from God or the peace of God. It's peace with God. The peace, the peace that comes with God comes in surrender. we talked about this before but but the metaphor just it just works the best that our lives has a throne our lives has a chair on it God does not come and sit on your lap God does not share his chair of authority and rule with anyone and that includes you and God just says either I'm in control or you're in control either I'm an authority or you're the authority Either you're going to surrender to me, but I'll tell you this much, I'm not surrendering to you because I'm God and you're not. And so you don't get the peace with God until you completely surrender to him. And whatever it is that you're wrestling, that thing right now, that thing, and I, you, you know I do this a lot, that thing right now that you're, that you're wrestling with, not that thing, but the other thing, the thing that you keep trying to push out of your mind saying, no, he's not talking about that. Yeah, that's the thing that God's put on your heart right now. That's the thing. Until we deal with that thing, there's no peace with God. So what is that thing that you're trying to put out of your head right now? That's the weakest place of peace. And there will be no peace, no true peace, no shalom until you deal with that. And God will wait. He's been waiting a long time. He'll continue to wait. But don't think there'll be peace until there is a full and complete surrender. So Father, I pray for my friends here today those who have come here today for the first time and this is all brand new to them and, and they're like I just I, I want to have peace from God I, Lord I want to surrender my life to you I want to give my life to you I, I accept what your son has done Lord may this be the best Christmas ever for them may they share that with one of the past may they share that with their friends and say I don't know but something happened today something changed I, I think I'm getting this thing for those of my brothers and sisters that are struggling, going through some difficult times, and, and there's a lot of anxiety with Christmas, and we're just not sure how it's going to go with the family, and uh, like it's in January, there's some stuff that's coming up in January, and, and you know what, Christmas is a great diversion, but, but boy, the stuff that I've got on my plate in the new year, Lord, let us trust and not control. Let us surrender completely and wholly to you. And whatever it is that we're holding on to that gives us a facsimile of peace, may we surrender that to you in Jesus' name. We just let it go. That thing that I'm holding on, Lord, I just let it go. Would you bring peace where there's only control? Father, I pray this for my friends and family and myself, for our church. I pray this, Lord, for our community. 
Lord, we want to see peace in London. We want to see peace in our, in our neighborhoods, Lord. We want to see peace in our country. Lord, we do want to see world peace. We're making a mess of it. So would you, the Prince of Peace, would you come in the power of the words, the power of your glory, and would you do for men what men cannot do for themselves? And may we be receptive of that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.